Well, we're approaching the peak of the New Testament in one sense. Many would regard the most precious book of the entire New Testament as the book of Romans. It's the definitive statement of Christian expression in the entire Bible, the book of Romans. And in the book of Romans, right in the middle, 16 chapters, chapter 8, is probably the most remarkable chapter in the Bible in many respects. And you're going to want to index, put a tab or something on this chapter. Because if you're ever down, down uh, discouraged, confused, all you have to do, jump in with both feet in the middle of Romans 8. And you'll see why as we get into it. We're taking three evenings to get through. We normally go about a chapter an evening normally. But with Romans chapter 8 we're taking, we've, we've had one session already. We're having a middle section this time. And we'll do the wrap up next time. But we're, we're in chapter 8, part 2 of three parts. And just by way of review, the first chapter in the book of Romans was the introduction and background, and he takes on three people to be representative of all people. First is the pagan man. The pagan man. What, what's the plight of the pagan man? Chapter 2, he took more, uh, two more. The, the uh, moral man, and finally the religious man. The point of those three categories being they're all lost. Clearly the pagan is lost because the creation alone is enough to indict him. It's astonishing how God is jealous of being the creator. As New Testament Christians, we often miss that because we so focus on the redemption, and indeed we should, that's good. But what's amazing to me to discover as I search the Bible in support of our Genesis commentary to realize how from end to end God is primary uh, measure is to be recognized as the creator of the universe. And so a pagan man is indicted by that. Then we, in chapter 2, we ran into the moral man, the guy that seems to, at least by our standards, lead a moral life, and yet that still falls short of what God would have. And finally, the religious man. And of, the, of the, all the religious people he chose, he chose Jews to be the exemplar of those that pretend to keep laws but don't. And so we have those. That, that basically, the first two chapters levels the playing field to show us our need for God's intervention, and he's provided that. And then we encountered God's biggest problem. God has a problem? Yes, he has an enormous problem. Because there's something he'd like to do that he, did, he can't violate his own nature. His, viol his nature is just. How does a just God forgive sin? And even Socrates puzzled over that. It may be possible that the de deity can forgive sins, but I don't see how, he said, apparently. God's greatest problem, how does he, as a righteous God, forgive those that he loves despite their sin. And that leads us to the great gift, God's greatest gift. And uh, I love the way Hal Lindsey adopts the word grace as an acronym. Grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. That giving his son to pay the price of the sinner would allow God to justify the sinner for fellowship with him despite his predicament. He paid the price. So that led us to a study of the sequence towards maturity. And uh, uh, tribulation gives us patience. And the, and the climax of that chain was hope, astonishingly enough. And then we had chapter 6, which started to reach us about empowerment. By then we figured we've come to the realization that we are sinners in need of help. We get help by having our passport stamped. That's called justification. We're justified by our belief in Christ. But we then discover that sin doesn't have to reign in our life anymore. You were speaking here of sin as controlling. Sin ain't going to reign no more. That was chapter, chapter 6, and that led us to chapter 7, which we call law school. What's the role of the law then? By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. That's not its role. That's not its job. His job is to show us the need for a Savior. And this whole background now gets climaxed in chapter 8, which many, many scholars throughout history have marked the high watermark, not only in the book of Romans, but in the whole New Testament in many respects. And we're gonna, we can look at the book of Romans another way, by the work of the Trinity. We saw God the Father in the forefront in chapters 1 through 3, verse 20. And then God the Son in salvation, Romans chapter 3 through the law school. 
And now we're going to see God the Holy Spirit who addresses the challenge of sanctification. We generally won't use the word salvation because that's confusing. That can mean many things. I was saved last week. Theologically, no, I was saved from a burning building or something. You can be saved many ways. The, the elements of salvation will focus on the elements of it, which are three. Justification, sanctification, glorification. We'll talk about those specifically. Now, chapter 8 is in contrast in many ways to chapter 5. Chapter 5 focused on the saving work of Jesus Christ. Chapter 8 is going to talk about what Christ did to provide victory in each of our lives. It's one thing to be saved, it's quite another to have victory over sin. Chapter 5 talked about justification by faith, which is forever. If you're justified by faith, it's nailed. And you'll see why as we go forward in this chapter. In chapter 8, the godly life is ensured through the power of the Holy Spirit. You can have a godly life despite your sin nature, but it'll require reliance on the Holy Spirit. Chapter 5 talks about performance based on understanding God's love for us. Chapter 8, performance is based on the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Those are two different things, both powerful. Chapter 5 reveals our relationship to God. Chapter 8 reveals our relationship to the world. Conflict, flesh, tribulation, especially the first half of the chapter, that's what we're in. It's going to shift very dramatically before we get to the end of this chapter. Chapter 5, the Holy Spirit's mentioned only once, but in chapter 8, it's mentioned 19 times. The power available through the Holy Spirit is developed to the fullness in chapter 8. Chapter 5 is the capstone of our salvation in Christ. You might substitute the word justification. Chapter 8 is the capstone of our victory in Christ, as you'll see in breathless terms by the time we get to the end of the chapter. Romans 8. The first 13 verses that we looked at last session was primarily our deliverance from the flesh. That's what we dealt with primarily last time. And also the realization of our sonship, that we are his sons, awaiting for the adoption. And we talked about that last time. What do I mean by that? In the old world, a son was not a son until he was adopted, and only then did he inherit. You could be a, not a natural son, but be adopted, and it was irrevocable and caused you an inherit. You could be a natural son of the father, but you might not inherit, because inheritance implied obedience. One of the things we need to study, and we will in subsequent sessions, get into this whole business of inheritance and how you can forfeit it. All through the Old Testament and New Testament, inheritance was not assured except through obedience. That's disturbing. We're going to touch on some of that here. However, once you're adopted, you could never be disowned. That's pretty exciting. That's pretty exciting. Some of you may recall the, the novel written by Lou Wallace, the governor of New Mexico, called, uh, called uh, Ben-Hur, where he, through a, an act of saving this very powerful Roman's life, gets adopted into his family. It becomes his, his heir, if you will. He wasn't Roman. He was Jewish. Ben-Hur was. But he gets adopted by Quintus Arius and all that, and, 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 and it's a colorful part of the story. But anyway, that's the, uh, uh, for, dramatizes the adoption issue. Well, we're going we're gonna to get in chapter uh, 8, verse 18 to 30 tonight, which is going to focus, among other, on among other things, why do Christians suffer? There are a lot of books written about that. A lot of people puzzle. Why do bad things happen to good people? And why do Christians suffer? And the more Christian you are, it seems, the more you suffer. Why? It's deliberate. Let's talk about that. One of the reasons that people suggest that this time that we call life here on the earth is a boot camp. When someone joins the, the military, Army, Navy, whatever, they usually get thrust into what typically is called boot camp or something equivalent to it, where they get trained before they join the, the main event. And many people look at life as a boot camp for heaven. What does that mean? We'll talk about that a little bit. Last time, near the final part, as we were closing in the last session, we were verses 16, 17, 18 in that area. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are what? The children of God, or the sons of God. That's a very strange term, by the way. Many people don't realize how distinctive that term is, the sons of God. 
In the Old Testament, that term was emphatically used of a direct creation by God himself. Adam was a son of God, because God created Adam. Adam's children were sons of Adam, not sons of God. The term sons of God in the Old Testament is used of angels, because they were direct creations of God, long before the earth was formed, incidentally. Now, it's interesting that when you get to the New Testament, you say, well, that was just an Old Testament idiom. No. In John chapter 1, verse 11, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to what? Become the sons of God. In other words, a direct creation of God. If you're in Christ, you are a new creation. You're not an old creation fixed up or repaired. You're not a heart that's been cured. You've been, you have a heart that's been replaced. A new heart. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children or sons of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God. And joint heirs with Christ. You know, we have no capacity to imagine what that means. Joint heirs with Him? Wow. If so be, oh, there's a catch. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be also glorified together. See, this is a conditional reward. Everybody assumes if you get to heaven, you're going to reign with Christ. Not necessarily. You may not inherit. Ooh. Is entering heaven and inheriting heaven the same thing? Well, you're going to enter a Hilton Hotel. I don't think you're inheriting it. I don't have to go down that path around these days, do I? Okay, right. If so be that we suffer with Christ. Everybody assumes you get to heaven, you're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Not necessarily. You'll be in heaven. Will you be at the wedding feast? That depends on some things. I'm going to suggest to you the possibility that many, maybe most, people that get to heaven will be disappointed. <sighs> They'll be glad they got to heaven. Don't misunderstand me about that. But they may be shocked to realize that all these glib promises that TV preachers have made ain't necessarily so. There's a thing called rewards. 1 Corinthians 3, check it out. That you may be saved, but as by fire. Depends on what you have done for the kingdom. And not what you have done, what the Spirit has done through you. And there's a big difference. Well, I attended Sunday school regularly. So what? Was that of the Spirit or was that of the flesh? Oh, there's some tough questions coming. Christian suffering. And this is, this, this is a class one since. Remember, there's four classes of, of ifs in the Greek. This is since indeed. Greek is the most explicit language ever devised. Every verb has to meet five conditions. The structure, the tightness of Greek is unparalleled anywhere else. And perhaps that's why God chose it for the New Testament. The Hebrew has some very peculiar properties, and that was very appropriate for the Old Testament. But Greek is very different in every, almost every way, and yet its precision of expression is astonishing. It's very, it often takes five or six sentences to translate just one word in the Greek because of all that's communicated with the, because of its syntax and structure. Now, you and I can't imagine what verse 17 man, means that we're going to be joint heirs with Christ, right? And I think you, 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 you try to compare that to your wildest dreams. It won't match up. We have no idea what that means. But, let, but Paul says, so 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, But it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. You can't imagine. You can't imagine what's coming. And Romans verse 17 through 27 is going to contrast our present state with that coming glory. Because both are ours. But continuing in Romans 8, Paul says, For I reckon, that's like bringing to account, sitting down and doing an accounting analysis, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Well, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> Jesus suffered trials, and he promised his apostles that they would also suffer those trials. You all heard, you know all the passages. There are two possible errors we can make about suffering. The first is not to anticipate them. 
We, are, we have been promised by our king that we're going to have trials. The word trials and temptations in the translation is the same. Temptations really we think of as a little differently. The trials is what he's talking about. So many of us either don't anticipate the trials on the one hand, or we have a morbid fear of them. That's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to count it all joy, James tells us, right? What does that mean? We need to have the divine viewpoint. Part of what we're in the Word of God for, why we're here tonight, is to try to stand back from the world and get God's perspective to put things in perspective. Every businessman knows that the most valid thing, most precious thing in life is a perspective. If your perspective is valid, you know what questions to ask and you get answers to any question. The trick in life is to have a valid perspective, not to have blinders, to really have a perspective. Remember Job and his three friends. Remember Paul. Paul had his, they, Job had his troubles, right? If you think that the book of Job is, answers the question, why do the, the innocent suffer? It was never answered. See, you and I are treated to a conversation in the first chapter that Job did not, was not a party to. The challenge between Satan and God about Job. He was a victim of a bet, so to speak. He didn't know any of that stuff. He's just trying to get along, right? What a saga. What about Paul? You know, you have, you have all these guys on television saying, if you really have faith, you'll be rich, and you have a Rolex watch and a Cadillac in the garage, right? Gee, Paul didn't know that. If, you, if you're sick, it's because you don't have enough faith. Really? Tell that to Paul about a thorn in the flesh, where God says, my... Faith is sufficient for you. No, that, that, that misteaching of the health and wealth types, the name it and claim it, the blab it and glab it cries, whatever. The, the, uh, anyway. No, we need the divine viewpoint on these things and how Paul measured success. And uh, you and I are going to be joint participants in his glory, and we need to try to understand some of the things that may lead up to that. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You can't get there. you got to let the Holy Spirit bring you there. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about what? In the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body, for, which, for we which live are already delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus may, might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. That's what we're all about, to manifest Christ. And he'll use some very interesting ways to do that. Continues, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You know, it's astonishing to me to read these passages that I've read since I was a teenager and thought I understood. And then I pick up Scientific American and see where the scientists are perplexed because they now realize that this thing we call reality is but a shadow of a larger reality. And they're amazed by that. And I sit there chuckling. Because that's what the scripture said when I was 12. Yeah, a couple generations ago. Those of you that are mathematical can figure it out. We know that the nucleus of an electron is about 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. The electron going around it, the, the, the orbit of that is 10 to the minus 8. 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the 13th, that's 10 to the 5th between 100,000. In other words, whatever the nucleus is, the electron is 100,000 units away from that. Okay? One, 10 to the 5th, 100,000. Well, if that's the distance linearly, the area of that thing is 10 to the 5th times 10 to the 5th. And the volume of that is 10 to the 5th times 10 to the 5th times 10 to the 5th, or 10 to the 15th. In other words, if I take an atom, the simplest atom, 
the part that's real and the part that's illusory has a ratio of 1 to 10 to the 15th. That's a big number. If you believe the world is about 15 billion years old, that's about 10 to the 15th seconds. So the ratio of materiality in, electron, in, a, in an atom to the space it occupies is about the same ratio as one second is to the history of a 15 billion year old universe. In other words, this podium is solid, right? No. If I say it's solid, I'm wrong. If Dan comes up here and says, no, that's mostly empty, he's right more than I am by one part in 10 to the 15th. You can't think of a bigger number than that. We look at things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. They're beyond time, outside time. Okay. Paul continues in another vein, he says, are, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, and labor's more abundant, and stripes more above measure, and prisons more frequent, and deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes. You want to talk about, he's doing this deliberately to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, contrary here, but... Uh, he, Thrice I was beaten by rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys oft in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Boy, that's the one that hurts too, by the way. That's the one that hurts, trust me. In weariness, in painfulness, in watching often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. That's Paul. In Hebrews, he continues. And what shall I more say? For Hebrews 11 talks about the kinds of witness that God's looking for. What, shall, what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, Samson and Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Every time I read that, I think of some of our leaders who signed an agreement with the Roman Catholic Church, which basically took the position that these millions of people that voluntarily were burned at the stake did so because of a misunderstanding? That they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder. And I believe that's an allusion to Isaiah, who was sawed in half with a wooden saw, apparently. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that without us should not be made complete or perfect. Wow. This sounds pretty dramatic, doesn't it? Why am I getting into this here? Because many of us in this room are going to have this opportunity to experience the same thing. We meet here very comfortably. We don't have to be in secret. That's a blessing we take for granted. That's a rare privilege on the planet Earth. Where do we, as Americans, have the arrogance to presume we're going to be spared of what most of the body of Christ in most of the world, 
for most of the last 19 centuries has had to endure. It's called persecution. You're talking about the Great Tribulation. No, I'm not. Just because we believe we can prove from the Scripture that the church will not go through a three and a half year period that's labeled by Jesus Christ himself as the Great Tribulation. Where do we get the arrogance to presume that we're going to have it, you know, cool and easy for the rest of our lives? And if we don't, the Scripture says, count it all joy that we can join these that we're talking about. Gee, Chuck, that sounds pretty grim. No, it's an opportunity. We'll see why here in a little bit. Why do Christians have trials? That's the question. Well, to glorify God is one of them. Daniel chapter 3, we know all the story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Okebunit and Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. The missile translation says, up yours, O king. You know. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound in the midst of the burning fire furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded. He rose up in haste and spake, said to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? He answered, said to the king, True, O king. He said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake. And by the way, you know, they heated that furnace up seven times higher than normal. The officers that put him in got burned, interestingly enough. Anyway, Nebuchadnezzar came near the mouth, mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake, and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God. This is Nebuchadnezzar talking. Come forth and come hither. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. And the next chapter in Daniel was written by Nebuchadnezzar. And posted throughout the known world of his testimony that the God of Daniel was the God of heaven and earth. When I get to heaven, I will not be surprised if Nebuchadnezzar is there. I expect him to be there. I may be wrong, but that's what I expect. That's what I believe. Well, so why do they have that? Well, glorify God is one reason God may subject you to some comparable opportunity, and what a joy that would be if you have a divine perspective. Another reason we have trials is discipline for known sin. Oh, boy. Well, okay, we've got plenty of verses on that. Another, we have trouble, to prevent us from falling into sin. What a blessing that is. 1 Peter 4, a couple of verses. For as much that as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sins, that he no longer should live the rest of his life in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. That's one of the reasons you might be having trials, is to wake you up to the realities that you're facing. Another one is to keep us from pride. Well, that's a good, there's a good example there. That's Paul. Paul suffered to keep him humble. That was what the thorn in the flesh was all about. Read, it up, read, read Paul on that. Another reason is pretty obvious, to build faith. And some of your most biggest trials are God's way for you to build your faith. Now, if you want to understand that, really, I encourage you to get my wife's book, Faith in the Night Seasons. It's incredible the research she's done from the ancient writers on that whole issue. There's very, very few modern writers that have really dealt with the dark night of the soul and all of that. And uh, I remember John Ankerberg when he encountered that book, he took it to his staff and had them all sit down and read the first chapter together. He says, this book is God-breathed because it deals with something you won't find elsewhere, the faith in the night seasons. To cause growth in general. To cause growth. That's one of the reasons we have trouble. To cause growth. Another one is to teach obedience and discipline. It's straightforward stuff here. Straightforward stuff. And it's all in the notes that accompany this. You can write them down now if you want or you can just take it from the notes. Oh, number eight. And by the way, I'm indebted to this particular list. There's many lists like this in the literature. I've taken these, these from a book called Combat Faith by Hal Lindsey. The eighth one, equip us to comfort others. If you're going through some peculiar, particular trial, 
one of God's purposes might be to equip you to comfort others that will be going through that in the future. Going through bankruptcy in your business, there might be a reason for that, that you can comfort others going through bankruptcy in business. Or fill in the blank with whatever it might be. That might be God preparing you to be a special kind of counselor to people who, there are certain kinds, you can't walk in somebody else's shoes. And there may be people that have a need for shoes that you did walk through. But you can talk that language. You can speak. speak, speak. The other reason, probably one of the broadest reasons here, is to prove the reality of Christ in us. People are watching. People are watching. But I remember at the academy how often we discovered that our impressions of the upperclassmen, they'd watch when we were in adversity to see how we handled it, see what we were made of. And there's the strangest one to close it up with. As a testimony to angels, <laughs> you've got to be kidding. No, it's, there's some very interesting verses. We'll just pick this one up. 1 Peter 1. Peter himself says, Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost, sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Wow. See, we tend to assume the angels know everything. No, they're sent on certain missions. But the picture we get from several hints in the scripture is that God chooses to reveal his plan incrementally. In the word, of course, it's incremental. But also to them. You sort of get the impression or they're watching to understand what God is doing by watching what we're doing. That's how his will is becoming manifest. Interesting. Interesting. Which things the angels desire to look into. Now all of this can be climaxed in the first chapter of the epistle of James, the Lord's brother. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations. The word there really means trials, divers trials. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect or complete work, that ye may be complete and entire, wanting nothing. The word perfect there is perfected in the sense of being completed. Okay? Count it all joy. Boy, oh boy, boy. That's, that's, a, that's a tough thing. You just found out that something really went wrong. Hit you between the eyes. Count it all joy. Oh, come on, Chuck. You gotta be kidding. No. That's what James is telling so that what God has... See, there's nothing that can happen to you that isn't father-filtered. And that's a great comfort. When something really goes wrong, what a comfort to know that God's in it. And I'll, I'll prove it to you before the chapter's over. Count it all joy. Well, let's, we're, we're, this is all by warm-up. Let's get back to Romans, back there where we started, left off last time. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. And joint heirs with Christ. <laughs> Every time I see that, I can hardly believe what that... I, I, I cannot grasp what that must mean. That we are joint heirs with Him. Ah, here's the rub. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified. This is a conditional reward. If so be that we suffer. When you suffer, you're picking up points that are going to count in the real scoreboard, the important scoreboard. That's why I say many that arrive in heaven are going to be disappointed. They're going to be shocked that a lot of the things they took for granted are not to be taken for granted because they're conditional. They're based on obedience. Your salvation isn't. That is, your justification isn't. But anyway... Let's move on. For the, for Paul says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. The word there for create, uh, creature, created thing or creature is ketis. And it is, ketis is a, it really should be translated created collectively or individually. Better translation would be for the earnest expectation of the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. The sons of God are going to be manifest when he comes. And that's what they're waiting for. The interrelationship of man with his physical creation, which he was a part of, 
was established in God's sentence of the punishment on Adam after the fall. In Genesis chapter 3, there's a curse pronounced upon the creation because of Adam's sin. The interrelationship is there manifest. And by the way, the word sons of God is a term referring to the creation, a direct creation of God. And when it's manifested that we are new creations in him, that's when the creation itself is going to rejoice. Let's go remind ourselves Genesis chapter 3, back there. When, they, when they, they blew it, Adam and Eve, you all know the story. The Lord God said unto the serpent, the Nachash, the shining one, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and the dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. That's interesting. Between thee and the woman. Isn't it interesting how Islam singles out the women? Adversely? Tell me it's not satanic. Opportunity, enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Ah, there's two seeds. The seed of the woman is a title of Christ. We all use that term. We forget there's another seed. Seed of the serpent, and he's forthcoming. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commended thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. You see the connection though the, with the creation and the curse with Adam. Why am I getting into this here? Because see we're under the curse. The creation also is involved in that curse of Genesis 3. And this is a future aspect of the redemption. Gee we're redeemed in Christ. Yes but so is the creation. That's the point that Paul's going to get into here. See the creation itself is eagerly awaiting. That's in verse 19. The verb for eagerly awaits is apetekomai. It's used seven times in the New Testament. Each time it's used, it refers to Christ's return. I think that's interesting. Tell me that there isn't design in the Scripture down to the very precision of the words. God's word is pure, the Scripture tells us. After the curse, see the revealing of the sons of God will occur, of course, when Christ returns for his own. And we'll share his glory, according to verse 18 and several other passages, and we will be transformed. But so will the creation. That's part of what's going on here. That's what verse 23 is going to hit here. All of nature, inanimate as well as animate, is personified as waking eagerly for that time. As we read about the lion and the lamb, or the, what is it, the wolf and the lamb can lie down together, Right? They can do that today, if the lamb's inside the wolf, right? Yeah. <laughs> Verse 20, for the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. The word vanity there means futility, frailty, purposelessness, failure, decay, perishable. Describes change and decay that pervades all created things. That's a scientific law we're going to talk about here in a minute. God judged the totality of his creation along with the people for their sin. His creation also bears that curse. There's a name for that curse we'll come to in a minute. Yet the curse was insti instituted with a future hope, and that's what, what Paul is calling our attention to here. Because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Here, the, here again is the word katissus, katissus, I guess I'm pronouncing it right. It's the Greek word for creation, creature, anything created. Uh, after rabbinical usage, by the way, they use that term for a man that's converted from idolatry to Judaism as being a new creation, which is interesting. That's a very, that's a very New Testament kind of theology. It, it refers to the sum or the aggregate of things created. So the word creation is a more inclusive translation, if you will. But the other thing is the 
Creation itself shall be delivered from what? The bondage of corruption. The bondage of corruption. Or the equivalent phrase would be the bondage of decay. Do you know that has a scientific name? That has a name that shows up in every field of science except one. It's called the second, in thermodynamics, it's called the second law of thermodynamics. The law of entropy. And I want you to understand the law of entropy. Because see, the whole universe we now watch, as we understand from every field of science, we realize it's winding down. It's like a big clock has been wound up and it's winding down. Nowhere is it winding up. It's all winding down. And that's the entropy laws. In fact, by the way, one of the questions that we should be asking, okay, who wound it up? Who wound it up in the first place? It's all been wound up. Well, we're going to have, if we just have one-tenth of percent difference in the ozone layer, it's going to be cosmic doom. Oh, gee, that's interesting. Who balanced it in the first place? If it's that delicate, that proves it couldn't have been accidental. You're, the, the more rare it is, the more unlikely it was to be a result of randomness. I'm coming back to that. Thermodynamics. There are three laws that you learn if you're in college on thermodynamics. First law, conservation of matter and energy. Matter and energy can be exchanged one to another, but you can't create or destroy either one. Second law is the law of entropy, called the bondage of decay, if you will. The third law is everything has a positive finite entropy. Most people don't even get into that unless you're in, it, in the graduate school. The first law says basically there's no way to win. You can't create or lose. You, there's no way to win. Matter to energy, energy to mass, okay. That's where the E equals MC squared thing comes. That's how much energy you get for how much mass, but still it's just an equation. Second law, you can't even break even. Because every engine has a less than 100% efficiency. There's always a loss to the ambient temperature. And someday the universe will be at a uniform temperature, no more work can be done. They would call that the heat death. The third law says you can't get out of the game. You can't win, you can't break even, you can't even get out of the game. That's pretty what thermodynamics says. But the real one I want to focus on is what's known as the second law of thermodynamics, the bondage of decay. We find it in the scripture, by the way, all through the scripture. We find it everywhere, actually. But in Psalm 102, of old thou hast laid the foundation of the earth, the heavens are the work of thy hands, they shall perish, really, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture thou shalt change them, and they shall be changed. That's an expression of the bondage of decay. Isaiah 51, 6, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, the earth shall wax old like a garment, see it's going old. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner, but my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Then Matthew says the equivalent kind of thing, heaven and earth shall pass away. The word shall not pass away. Entropy, what are we talking about here? All information that is useful is ordered. Is ordered. Alphabets make up words, which make up language. That's order. That contrasts with noise, which is randomness. If you're a communications engineer, you deal with signal to noise ratio. Signal is what you want, noise is gets in the way. The ratio of signal to noise is how good your thing is, whether it's a bandwidth or whatever. See? Noise is entropy, randomness. Signal is something ordered that you're after. Now, there's a thing called disorder. The opposite of that is order. You with me so far? A thing called noise, and the opposite of that is a signal. Something you're interested in, noise is what you're trying to get out of the way. Cacophony and music. Today that's hard to tell, but I won't get into that here. Uh, <laughs> there is chaos, confusion, and the Greek term for order is cosmos. And the word cosmos means bringing order out of chaos. It's the root from which we get the word, term cosmetics. <laughs> it is, all right? <laughs> Ran this, on the left here is randomness, different expressions of randomness. On the right are different expressions of the opposite of randomness, which is design. Over here we call that entropy. Over here we call that information. That's how they're different. One is ordered, one is not ordered. They're opposites to each other. In fact, it's even worse, there's an inherent flow towards entropy. It takes energy and commitment to bring order out of disorder. Your front hall closet, your locker at school, your desk at home or at work, whatever. 
You leave it alone, its tendency is to disorder. When you're willing to set aside a Saturday morning and spend the time to get it straightened out, great. How long does it last? The drift, obviously, is to entropy. It takes energy and effort and information to go the other way. Now, in the information sciences, there is a thing called randomness, and you would be astonished at how difficult it is to get randomness. See, most of us were taught in school a kind of mathematics that's called deterministic. Two plus two equals four, always. A plus B equals C, always, whatever, okay? That's deterministic. E equals MC squared, F equals ME. That's deterministic mathematics. There's another field of mathematics that's called stochastic processes, just a fancy word, in which some of the elements in the equation are random. The average height of a woman walking through a, 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 an aircraft door. The guy designing that door has got a problem. How tall is a woman? Well, she's about this tall, but it can have this variance, and you suddenly you're dealing with, whoops, the height is a variable. It's got to be, it's, it's part of a probability distribution, you see? And you've got women and men, well, they vary, they're not, they both vary, but they have, you, know, point, you suddenly just, you're plunged in the real world in which data is, has included in it a random element. Whole different field of mathematics, by the way. And uh, so, it turns out, by the way, in science and laboratories, you often need, for certain reasons, a source of numbers that are truly random. Now, <laughs> where do you find a random number? How can you get a number that's truly random? And let me ask you a better question. How do you know it's random? How do you know? Here's his set of numbers. How do you know they're random? One of the great think tanks in the world is called the Rand Corporation. And back when I was with Rand, not, I had nothing to do with this, but they, they published a book. In, in fact, it was 1955. They published this book um, called A Million Random Digits. You say, oh, come on, you've got to be kidding. What's it all about? Just random numbers. The question is, how do you know they're random? It took the biggest think tank of the world at that time, using the most powerful computers that were available at that time, to go through these and wash them and scrub them to make sure that there was no periodicity, there's no repeatability, there were no patterns of any kind, that they were truly random. Because there were occasions for certain experiments and so forth, the scientist needed to be able to reach in and pick up some numbers that he knew were random. That begs the question, what do you mean by randomness? So this is the Rand Corporation's one million random digits and 100,000 normal deviates. You say, you've got to be kidding, they published a book on that? It represented at the time a milestone in, of scientific publication. Try to find a better source today. Well, I can do it in the computer. No, you can't. What the computer has in it is a generator called a pseudo-random number generator. And there are a string of numbers that have, for certain limited expressions, a reasonable amount of randomness, but they're not perfect. I was chairman of Western Digital, and one of the first, thing, first uses we made of the data encryption chip was to use it as a source of random numbers, because that was something that was needed inside a computer. A million random digits. That's all it is. Now, why am I getting into this here? Because I want you to remember this. How do you tell that it's random? Because, this is not as trivial as it sounds, what is its defining characteristic? I want you to remember this, if nothing else, about the, this silly example. It has the total absence of design. They used the best computers, the best minds to go through this to make sure there was no design evident, no repeatability, no patterns, no design. If you would have told those scientists back then that we're going into a day where it's going to be illegal to teach our kids in school that it takes intelligence to design, that, the, that our universe, our bodies, all these things happen by randomness, they would think you're putting them on. 
That would be an IQ test that anyone would fail. They didn't understand that randomness is the opposite of design. And we're in a culture that is inculcated. Our culture, our teachers, our legislators, our attorneys before juries. Total ignorance of the role of design. Design happened by randomness. Anyone that's been in here in a design team knows that if you have a design team of any complexity, there's coordination and skillful coordination required to make, bring it home all together. And uh, anyway, okay. Same thing's true with design. Design is order. Chaos is the absence of order or entropy. Every field of science recognizes this except one. Things go from order to disorder intrinsically. Only biology and anthropology attempt to ignore entropy. That's where you get the ascent of man. The whole idea that you can have random chemicals that somehow get together and produce a living cell. More complicated than any, most cities on the earth, etc. The entire theory of evolution, we use that term, what we really mean is biogenesis. I'm not talking about microadaptation and all that. That's not, the issue is the origin of life. Is a direct violation of the entropy laws. Anyway, Paul continues here with that background because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. They'll, the creation is going to be delivered from, in some sense at least, the entropy laws. Really? Boy, that changes everything. It's going to be, begin with a relief of nature's curse in Isaiah, Micah, Zephaniah, Zechariah. It's all through the Old Testament. Can a wolf lie down with a lamb today? Yes, if the lamb's inside the wolf, right? Yeah. It's going to be different then. For a thousand years, there'll be people living on the earth without the curse. Now, will it be totally gone or slightly lifted? I have no idea. But clearly, there's going to be some major changes, not just you and I, but in the creation itself. So, God's program for the salvation for people is one of a new creation. And Paul talks about that in several of his letters. The physical world is also going to be recreated. Now, we're going to now encounter three groans in the Romans 8. Three, even the groans are going to be beneficial here. Groan number one of three. Now, what do I mean by a groan? What's well, the term? It's translated. It means an intense longing, an emotional pain. The entire creation is presently suffering. You thought you were? No, the whole creation is. Paul says in verse 22 of Romans 8, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. That's a strange idea, isn't it? Whether it's a volcano or whatever, you can you just you let your imagination go. That's groan number one of three. Now, deliverance of the creation is going to be in two stages. Stage one is going to be the renovation of the present cosmos. The return to the earth of the Lord Jesus will be stage one. The establishment of the messianic kingdom on the earth. My wife and I are doing some research and making some, what we, for us at least, is remarkable discoveries. And that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth may not be synonyms. Most commentators assume they are. We're beginning to suspect they're not. There's some interesting differences. The messianic kingdom. That's really, only Matthew uses that term 33 times. Interesting. So my wife and I are diligently exploring that area and going to be, be uh, working in that area. The second stage, of course, is the new at the end of the millennium, the new heaven and new earth. So there's two stages of complete renovation of the creation. Complete renovation. Verse 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan with us. So the creation is growing, now we're groaning, right? Ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption of our body. That's what we're waiting for, right? This is groan number two. By the way, the believers here are described as having the first fruits of the Spirit. Here's where the Greek grammar helps us a little bit to understand. Most people don't realize what that means. The appositional use of the genitive means that the Holy Spirit is the first fruits of God's work, salvation, and recreation in the believers. The Holy Spirit itself is the, the, is the fruit, if you will. Interestingly enough, you think of it. The word groan is in the present tense. It means we keep on growing, groaning. We're continuing to grow. Each believer has already received the spirit of sonships. That's what this is arguing. Each believer has the spirit of sonship. Remember the prodigal son. He blew the inheritance. He never lost his sonship. There's a difference between 
sonship and inheritance. You can blow the inheritance, you're still the son. The redemption here, apolotrusen, is a Greek word for the release or deliverance achieved by a ransom payment. That's us, huh? We're called, by the way, revelation of the sons of God, back in verse 19, remember? The glorious freedom of the children of God, that's in verse 21, a couple of verses ago. The day of redemption is the term Paul uses in his Ephesians letter. It will occur at the harpazo, or the rapture, when the believers will be transformed with glorious new bodies, and your scripture is full of those. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, and 2 Corinthians 5, 2, where we get the, the habitation. And of course, 1 John 3, 2, incredible passages. But we're running out of time, let's get moving here. On to verse 24, for we are saved by hope, but that hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. That makes sense. Doesn't need a lot of comment. But this gets saved. See, back here, we are saved by hope. What do you mean by saved? Here we get this. That's a dangerous word. I was saved. What does that mean? You mean theologically? In what sense? Well, let's talk about that. It has, the way we're using it here in the Bible, three, three tenses. Three tenses of being saved. There is the past tense. Have been saved, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, where you're saved through faith, where by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it, that is the faith, is even a gift of God. That's positional salvation. It's called justification, to be more precise. And once you have that, that's like having your passport stamped. You are declared saved from the penalty of sin. You haven't changed yet, but your passport is stamped because Jesus Christ paid for that stamp. You are justified. He is justified in letting you enter, enter heaven. That's your entrance ticket. Many people are comfortable with that. They think that's enough. They're in for a surprise, unfortunately. They've got their get out of hell free card. No, there's more coming than that. That's the past tense, the penalty of sin. The present tense of being, are, you're being saved. It's present tense continuing. That's operationally by the Holy Spirit, moment by moment. That's not a one-time thing. You go down the sawdust trail and make a decision for Christ, great. That's getting your justification. Are you being saved? I hope so. Operationally, by the Holy Spirit. You're being delivered from the power of sin. Penalty of sin, past tense. Power of sin, continuing present tense. That's called sanctification, to get it distinct, to, to be more precise. That's why salvation is a is a fuzzy term. Let's be precise. One is called justification. One is called sanctification. We're not through. There's a future tense. You shall be saved. What does that mean? From the presence of sin. That's called the redemption of our body here in verse 23. Past tense, penalty of sin. Present tense, the power of sin in your lives, day to day, moment by moment. You, sin need not reign over you. You have the power to overcome it through the Holy Spirit. You have the opportunity. You don't have the power. The Holy Spirit has the power. And of course, the element is to be delivered from the, even the presence of sin. Glorification. But if we hope for that we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. The word hope there and the word in the Greek is different than the way we use the word hope. It's stronger than no. I hope and I know. We see, from us, knowing is stronger than hope. No, in the Greek, it's the other way around. The hope is that you're trusting in something you can't see, but you're trusting in it with more certainty than if you could see it, in effect. That's the, that's the concept that's there. It's a confidence, a sureness of future things. It's almost the opposite of our use in, in the English. The, the, the word hope sort of implies a doubt in the English, right? And pekadekamai, eagerly await, is the term. And again, it's seven times in the scripture, always, of the return, always connected with the return of Christ, interestingly enough. And he who has the strongest hope will have the greatest ability under stress. That's what 2 Corinthians 4 was all about that we read earlier. We'll make it. Verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for, as we ought. But the Holy Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That's the third groan, isn't it? Creation groans, we groan, 
we now have uh, the Holy Spirit groaning for us. Now, this is groan number three, if you will. It says, the Holy, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. That's a present tense verb. He keeps on helping. He doesn't do it once and he's done. He keeps on. That's what the present tense means. It continu- it's, a, it's a continuing tense. Now, by the way, a lot of people misunderstand this, and I'm not here to offend anyone. I try, not, I try to have something to offend everyone. I don't want to play favorites. Um, there are many people that take this as somehow related to the gift of tongues. I'm not against the gift of tongues, but this ain't it. Why? Because it says so. The Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. Not us making intercession. The Spirit's going to make with groanings which cannot be uttered. To argue that those are tongues is reading something into it that's not there. The Holy Spirit is groaning in a way that can't be uttered. You see see what I'm getting at? Okay. So... This may not have anything to do with tongues. The groaning is done by the Holy Spirit, not believers. And apparently it's not stated in words, is the point. But not a big deal. I've mentioned it in passing. Verse 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Praise God for that. Now this is a statement about the intimacy of the Trinity. That's been all through here, but I want to just call your attention to it here. The Lord Jesus continually intercedes for, for the believers in God's presence. That's what Hebrews 7.25 is all about. And he's also going to be doing that in verse 34 that we haven't gotten to yet. Okay? This entire session then contrasts our present state with trials with the coming glory. Okay, so we have the... Okay, how are we doing here? Okay, we, we're going to make it here. Now we get to that verse which I suggest you put a tab on that page in your Bible. It'll save you a lot of time because I check this about once a day to make sure it's still here. If you don't know any other verse in the Bible, besides John 3.16, of course, you want to know Romans 8.28. We know that all things work together for good. For everybody, no. All things work together for good to them that love God. More than that, to them who are the called according to his purpose. But what a comfort that is. Now the quiz question is, in this verse, what are the three most important words? The first three. And we suspect that all nations, no, 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 that we, we, we hope that all things work together for good. Is that what it says? Uh-uh. And we know, we know that most things, practically everything, is that what it says? Oh. All things work together. Are you kidding? Do you take the Bible really seriously? Let me tell you, after literally... 60 years of studying the Bible and many times having to correct my impressions as I went along, of course, because I'm learning all along. It's always been in the direction of taking it more seriously than before. Yes, I'm an extremist. I believe that in Psalm 119, when he says, the word of God is pure. When Jesus says to Satan, quotes the scripture to him, that that, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word. Matthew 22, when he goes up against the lawyers and quotes the Psalm 110, he puts them to total confusion because of one yod that makes Adonai possessive. How can, if he's the son of David, how can David call him my Lord? It hangs out a yod. Every yod and tittle is there by design, the scripture says. So when it says this, do I believe it? Absolutely. Does it sometimes get me confused? Yes. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them are who? The called. Now here we open a Pandora's box of confusion. What do you mean, the called? And who called you? And how do you know? And how certain are you? And so forth. Because you think you understand it until you get to verse 29. 
For whom he did foreknow them, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I love what Charles Haddon Spurgeon said about this verse. He says, I'm sure glad... See, we know he chose me when? Before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1.4, right? I'm glad he chose me back then. Because if he saw me now, he might change his mind. <laughs> That was apparently originally with truth. God chose me before I was born. I'm glad he did. Otherwise, he might have changed my I love that. Uncertainty about the election can arise from some kind of self-righteousness. But we'll get more of that next time. But then he amplifies this in verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. That's your unbreakable links. Five unbreakable links. The eternal choice and foreknowledge involves more than simply establishing a relationship between God and the believers. This involves the certainty of your sanctification. And that has caused hundreds of years of theological wars trying to reconcile that. What about the carnal Christian that, gets, that falls away? Was he not saved in the first place? Is he, if, he, if he doesn't see it all through to the end, is he saved or not? The Arminians have their answers. The Calvinists have their in, answers. They're both right in what they assert, and they're both wrong in what they deny, and there is a middle path that we'll talk about as we go here a bit. And uh, that's a whole study that I'm indebted to my wife. We're doing some, for which for us, is some real research. Some very different perceptions emerging out of that. Those that God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. That's what he said a verse ago, right? There are five phases here. Forno, he foreknow, predestinate, called, justified, glorified. That's the link. Unbreakable chain of five links. Whom he foreknow, then he predestinated, called, justified. How did he foreknow? God's knowledge. He's outside time. He can tell, he can tell the head before, ahead of it. He predestinated Abraham. There are many scholars who believe that Paul had the patriarchs in mind here. Abraham was predestinated. He was saved before he was circumcised. He was saved in chapter 15. He was circumcised in chapter 17. Okay? And he was saved before the law was given. That Paul makes a big thing of that in the earlier chapters of Romans, as you recall. So Abraham, in Isaac thy seed is called. That phrase is used in the scripture. It's quoted in... Uh, uh, Genesis 21.12 uh, I mean it's in 21.12 and it's quoted in Hebrews 11.18 in that very context and it's going to be dealt with when we get to Romans chapter 7 so we'll, I mean excuse me in uh, chapter 9 verse 7 excuse me and uh, after Isaac comes Jacob if God can justify that conniver he can justify any of us okay enough said would you buy a used car from Jacob I don't think so and of course, glorification, there's Joseph, and there have been publications of over a hundred ways in which the life of Joseph prefigures the life of Christ. Over, literally over, Martha W. Pink's to open that box, so there's a whole, it's, it's very interesting thing. If you want to, we have that in our Genesis commentary, it's also in our appendix to our Cosmic Codes book, you can find those if you want the whole list of the 110. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, who them are called according, be called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, whom he called, them he also justified, whom he justified, them he also glorified. Tying this all together is an assurance, not just of your justification, but ultimately of your sanctification. Your challenge is is to have it completed in time to enjoy some of the fruits. We'll talk more about that as we get into this. Well, we've been through verses 18 through 30. Why do Christians suffer in the boot camp for heaven? Next time, we're going to take the rest of this chapter, verses 31 to 39, and it's going to raise two of the most fundamental doctrinal issues that confront anybody. The whole issue of eternal security, what does it mean? Is it there? Is it not? Whatever. <laughs> And, even, and predestination versus free will. Is, if it's really predestinated, do we really have any choice? Does predestination make our choice illusory? 
Or do we really have a choice? And if so, what are the choices? And so forth. So let's just take a peek at what's coming. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. And who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which in, is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what we're going to take next time. Next session on what you want you to do. The faith versus free will issue. If things are prophesied or predestinated, do we really have any choice? How do you answer that? And what's wrapped up in is, can a Christian lose his or her salvation? That's a question. There are good people, good solid scholars say absolutely. There are other good scholars say absolutely not. Okay? We're going to deal with that head on next time. And this is going to, so it's going to focus on two doctrines, eternal security and what they call the perseverance of the saints. What about the saints that don't persevere? What's their situation? What I want you to do for next time is take 12 verses and memorize them. Romans 8, 28, pick the one up you want anyway, right? Carry it through to the end of the chapter, 39. Memorize it between next time. And as you do that in your notepad, take the seven questions and find out what the answers are. There are seven questions that are posed there. And I encourage you to take a look at that. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.